Hello everyone, and thank you for coming to my PyCon APAC talk. My name is Susan, and I'll be showing you how I used Python to help with making narrative-focused video games. Just as a bit of a talk overview, this is what I'm going to be going through in this presentation. Um, first, I'm going to give an overview of the gaming industry because um, I think based on feedback from previous talks I've given, um, it was really helpful to get an understanding of the industry and like what kind of games that we can make as hobby developers with Python. Second of all, I'm going to go through the specific kind of video games that um, we're talking about here today, which is a narrative focused or story focused video games. And then I'll go into a deep dive about RemPy, um, which is the open source Python based game engine that I have been using to make video games. And uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, actually, I don't make video games full time. Uh, what I do do full time is I work in the machine learning space. Uh, I'm a principal data scientist at ClearCo, which is a fintech unicorn startup um, based in Canada. And um, I'm also a contributing member of the Python Software Foundation, since I work on uh, some open source con contributions here and there throughout the years. Um, I have also spoken at PyCon US, PyCon Canada, PyCon India, and also PyCon Taiwan. Um, so aside from making games, I do use Python in my full time day to day. Um, education wise, I have a master's degree from the University of Toronto and a bachelor's degree from the University of Waterloo, both in Canada. And just to introduce the studio that I founded a little bit, um, our name is Quill Game Studios and uh, I am the lead developer. And I am not only the lead developer, but all of these things, um, the producer, the project manager, the writer, and um, doing marketing sales, so on and so forth. And actually for a long time, I was the only developer, but now that our team has grown, I've been working on training people so that I can do what I do best and other people can uh, help do a lot of these other things that um, can help the studio grow. But let's backtrack a little bit all the way to the beginning. Um, how did I start making games with Python and how did this become a actual video game studio? So in 2017, I had an idea for a story. I like to play games um, of all genres, but I really wanted to create something that has a lot of story and kind of like a deep world building because I really like those kind of games to be able to think about the game world after days have passed. So I designed this world and then I wrote out the story. I did some programming of it just to iterate and see what it might look like. And then I was like, well, I have a story. Now what do I do? Right. And it actually took me two years to get from this beginning point to where the game actually ended, ended up like. Um, so this is the first game that the studio has made and shipped uh, on Steam as well as all of the consoles. It's called The Summer with the Shiba Inu, and it actually has sold um, over 10,000 copies in its first year. So how did I do that and how can you do that too? I think first we need to understand a little bit of the uh, gaming industry just to uh, make it more clear to all of the audience like what kind of games we will be making with Python with this particular open source engine and what other types of options there are um, if you are interested in pursuing indie game development. So first of all, there are, of course, different platforms that you might be familiar with. We have the computer OSs and um, consoles, so you could have Windows, Linux, and Mac, and you have Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4, or the new generations of those consoles. Um, and we have, of course, like on the PC platforms, there's like Steam or itch.io, um, which are common platforms for these games to be distributed. So now first I want to introduce the concept of a triple A studio. So these are kind of like the Hollywood um, movie budgets, but of video game development. Um, they typically are very large video game companies and studios, and they have a lot of funding. 
So we could have um, Ubisoft, Blizzard, Activision um, being some of these well-known ones. Um, they make games like the ones on the screenshot, um, Assassin's Creed series, FIFA series, Overwatch, or The Last of Us. And these studios have often the most well-known games with very high budget that um, pushes the boundaries of technology even. And their games are usually played by millions of people. And the thing is, there could be tens of thousands of developers and artists on each and every one of the project, which will take care of one small thing. Um, so for example, the code for one type of gun only could be done by one or three developers, or maybe just a very small part of a quest design could be done by one person, and they all come together as a whole to create something. Um, and they could be selling millions of copies so just as an example of the um, potential large budget of these um, AAA studios, right? They're often in the millions, uh, hundreds of millions of US dollars. So you could see um, Call of Duty was 250 million USD for development and marketing. Um, we have Grand Theft Auto V, which also took a huge amount of funding. And of course, the recent um, Cyberpunk 2077, which we know um, also had a very high budget. So um, yeah, we have, on the other hand, indie studios, which are short for independent studios, are smaller but popular. Um, they Well, they could be smaller and have popular games. So for example, Stardew Valley was made by one person team. Um, Terraria had a small team. Baba is You is also made primarily by one person. And these are all games that have millions of users or have sold millions of copies. And um, if they're made by just one person or a team of small people, that could be making them multi-millionaires. And there are, I guess, like a third category, which is like some independent um, studios have a large budget. It's a bit more ambiguous, like they could have a small team, but a large budget. Um, so for example, um, PUBG is a pretty um, popular game, but they have been referred to as indie game developers in the past. So now I've given the overview of uh, AAA games and um, independent, like smaller team or in one person team games. I want to talk a little bit about narrative games. Um, so what are narrative driven games that I'm talking about here? Just to take one step back, right? Like we can think about narrative driven experiences as something that focuses on a story and it is possible for the player or viewer to interact with the experience and to change a little bit of the story or change the story drastically. So if you're familiar with um, Netflix and the series on it, Black Mirror, um, there is a movie version of uh, a movie that came out under this universe. And then in the movie, you can select what to do. You could, um, let's say, <laughs> jump out somewhere. You could accept an offer. You could refuse an offer. Um, and based on what you select in your browser, the different parts of the movie will play out. And then different endings and very drastically different endings um, well show. There's other games that are classic um, games like this, I think, on the Nintendo like old consoles. It's a series called the No Nary Games or 999, and you can do a lot of exploration and you wake up in a room with a bunch of people and people die off one by one. Um, so I guess it is a survival um, <laughs> a survival game. And a lot of the dialogue is basically conveyed through this text box below like this. And then there are some puzzle elements to it as well. Um, but primarily for most of the game, you're reading dialogue in this dialogue box, even though it's very suspenseful, um, very um, creepy and good atmosphere, um, mysterious atmosphere. And now we have some more um, recent games like Persona 5, which you might be familiar um, these are games with a gameplay element, um, but then they also convey most of their dialogue through these uh, kind of like dialogue driven, um, narrative driven, like they'll tell the story through the dialogue that's being told in the screen below, as well as Danganronpa, which is another 
um, kind of like death game <laughs> kind of kind of situation. You can tell I really enjoy this kind of scenario um, or like battle royale type situations in visual novels or narrative driven games. So basically, I would describe all of these as narrative driven experiences because you are reading and getting a lot of the information about the character and the game world through the kind of text that is shown up in these games. And of course, if you're not familiar with any of the games that I've mentioned earlier, you we have Pokemon, which I guess like they just have also the text in the dialogue box below. And I think this is probably recognizable to a lot of people. So you have spent time reading uh, these kind of uh, visual novel type or um, narrative driven games if you've played um, Pokemon. Yeah, and the reason why I wanted to talk first of all about AAA studios and indie games is because like a lot of the games I showed just now, even though they might not be as massive as like Ubisoft, which made Assassin's Creed, um, but they're usually made by pretty large studios with some personnel and some budget. Um, and when I was researching what kind of engines they used, a lot of them were custom made game engines, which um, makes sense. Like sometimes they might mix 3D and 2D and they could have different mechanics. But the thing is like they usually have a team of a lot of developers and so they can make their custom engines. But the thing is like as a solo independent developer, that means I'm, I'm the only developer. <laughs> like I cannot develop a custom engine. Um, they're expensive and or you have to hire people, which is also expensive. So here enter RenPy, which is a open sourced Python based game engine, which I found and I have been using for a long time. Um, so I already do use Python in my full time job, which is in machine learning. Um, and I guess all of us folks here, um, you're at Python, uh, PyCon, and you probably know that Py Python, I think, has pretty good documentation. And um, as is pretty common in game development, uh, object-oriented programming is a big thing in game development because of the way you design objects, characters, and interactable items, quests, and everything. So Python is, you know, you're capable of doing that in Python. So RepPy is a open source engine um, and you can make high production quality. So there are, there's kind of like this a month long hackathon, which is called like Nano Reno. I'm kind of like simplifying what Nano Reno is, but there are kind of like short games that are made in a short time span um, as like kind of practice games or just like for fun. But then there's also really high budget games that are also made in RenPy. And the um, main developer of of Pi of Rempi, um, Pi Tom, his philosophy was that he wanted to make the best way to make visual novels or narrative driven games and give it away for free. And I think he has done a great job at that. And uh, as I mentioned uh, before, like the object oriented programming paradigm is pretty standard in game development. Um, two of the main commercial engines, such as Unreal Engine, which uses C++, and the Unity Engine, which uses C Sharp, um, they, are, they can also have a lot of design patterns that are transferable, um, the way of thinking into Python. So I want to show some um, use cases of RemPy, or just like, I guess rather than use cases, I would say features of RemPy. Um, there is actually a way for people who are not that familiar with Python or um, people who just want to see the story script to see it more easily in RemPy. Um, so before I've mentioned that a lot of these narrative driven games, they are, they have a lot of text which are shown up in the text box below on the screen, or they can be shown up anywhere on the screen. Uh, but if you are the writer for this game or the programmer for this game, you want to be able to see a lot of these um, texts without, you know, all the Python brackets and everything. So actually in the back of RemPy, there is a Lexer 
uh, which you can actually find more about on the documentation that can allow you to write stuff that maybe doesn't look as Pythonic, but is actually really helpful for when you're collaborating um, with the writer and artist. Or you can just do it in plain Python. It all works. Um, some other features, you can have some different visual effects. This is a game that people might be familiar with, which is called Doki Doki Literature Club. Um, this one has had like tens of millions of tens of millions of downloads and it's very widely known um, and it is definitely a game made in RenPy. So you are very flexible in what you can do in RenPy. Uh, here are some samples of like visual effects, which you could do. Um, this is just like a very simple transition, but you, there is ways of doing animations. Um, like you can make thunder, rain, snow, or so on. Like if you know how to make this very simple transition. And uh, just a little bit of background on RenPy. Uh, it's based on Pygame, and I guess as folks in the audience might know that Pygame is a set of Python modules for video games. It's a very, I guess, like also well-known and commonly used Python modules um, for making games, and RemPy is actually built on top of that. Um, but actually, there is another part that RemPy uses, um, which is the Simple Direct Media Layer, SDL. Uh, which is written in C, but it works natively um, in C++, but there are, I guess, um, compatibility with Python or it has like wrappers that work with it. Uh, so this is also commonly used for games development. And then RemPy actually has updated to SDL2 um, instead of SDL only, which is currently still in Pygame. So Right now, RemPy has been making improvements and things to allow people who create with RemPy to have like new updates from the base um, technologies that it uses. Yeah, here's a simple demonstration of a uh, transition that I've made before when I was speaking at um, PyCon Canada and PyCon US. I did this um, when it was in when I was in person, I actually did this on stage. So I would just have a transparent image of the logo of the conference, and then I would just make a transition out of it. So this is done with just like a couple lines of code. And you can see how um, Python is very, uh, RemPy is very intuitive, I would say. And I think that you can see for yourself like how um, just with like one line of code, you can make little transitions like this. But of course, like normally you probably wouldn't be using this PyCon logo, but rather something else to mimic something like an effect, a different kind of screen effect. The next thing I want to talk about uh, is just like another thing you can do in, in RemPy. And because you can do this with Python, so you can do it in RemPy um, for the most part. Uh, this is just parallax, which is if you are based on like where the user's mouse is moving, like the the kind of viewport of the user is being calculated um, in time. So like you can see like the view angle and how like the kind of screen is changing based on like the user's mouse. So this is something that as long as you can calculate that with math, uh, you can do that in um, Python and therefore this is doable in RemPy as well. So you can have some effects which is kind of like you're looking here, looking there. Um, there's like this third party script um, that helps with uh, achieving like a 3D stage effect. So here you can see that the camera is panning, it's moving, and then you can kind of like zoom in, zoom out, go up, down, rotate and everything. So that is possible. Um, I'm just going to play the clip once again, and this is a game that I have been working on developing, which is um, coming out soon um, on Steam. It's called Death Becomes You. It's a murder mystery made in RemPy. Um, so right now we have the 3D stage, which is um, the native implementation in RemPy, which kind of has this um, you have like the X, Y axes, but then you also have like a Z or a Z <laughs> axis. Sorry, the Canadian in me just uh, said that <laughs> Z is how we pronounce Z sometimes. Um, but basically, you just have this other axis where you can lay out the 
um, closeness or the position of all of the images and all of the characters or backgrounds in order. So that is how you might implement, uh, how, how that's implemented in RemPy. Okay, I want to introduce some more functionalities of RemPy. Um, so for example, Long Live the Queen is a visual novel game, but it actually is a stats management, like a you manage how your character is and behaves by helping them learn different things, interacting with different characters and so on. And it actually has very different scenarios based on like what kind of stats you have and what kind of previous paths you have created. So Rempi can handle games that have, has like a huge amount of um, strategy component and a huge amount of like different scenarios and how those variables interact with each other. So complicated strategy games like that um, where you can encounter super different scenarios. Um, they are all, they are, have been made in RemPy. So you can also, if that's the kind of game you would like to make, you can make that. And uh, I want to talk about how if you already know Python, which is like awesome, it would help you a lot with like doing RemPy development work um, as well. So this is something I implemented, which is like a simple timer, like based on like how um, when the game has shown up the choices on the screen, um, after that, the player can read and then select the choice they want to make. And then it has a timer that says um, how long they took. So in Python, you might, you are probably familiar with just import random and import time. And you just start to make a class and you could just create something that does this functionality that um, makes makes um, just like keeps track of how the player um, has taken how long to make a choice. So this is something really familiar. It goes from Pyth your brain to Python to your coding and then it comes out in the game. And so for example, you can just like um, because it's like object oriented programming, you can use decorators and you can make classes. Um, so this is like one way I implemented just like using import random. It would just like grab a random um, sentence um, utterance from the list instead of always saying like hi or something you could say like different things like hello, how are you? Um, so that the behavior of these characters are a little bit different each time to give it a little bit of flavor. Yeah, so you can see that uh, pretty simple Python functionality, but then you can see how it shows up in the game. So you can go from your imagination to code to Python. So here's like... I just wanted to show that there's a lot of ways to customize the game. Like, it doesn't always have to look like the... Um, text box below, but rather because the text boxes themselves are designed as classes, you can just go and modify your class and you can still be able to reuse it very well um, because of object-oriented programming. So now that I've shown a little bit of functionality, like I just do wrap it up a little bit, um, you could remake something that's like has a really complicated story. You could make something like Netflix Bandersnatch movie in RemPy as well. Um, Rampi is often used to make games that are really complex with a different complex logic. Um, so for example, like games like this with this kind of visualization of like, if you choose this, this will happen. If you did that, this interaction will change what happens later in the game. Like this is all doable, um, in Rampi. So I just wanted to show a kind of small example. Like this is actually not even that complicated compared to a lot of games that I've seen made in Rempi, but this is just one way you could change the game states, you could monitor um, how the player has interacted and then show different things to the player, all in Rempi. So you can do really complex things in Rempi. So last thing I want to say is that your imagination's the limit. Um, so on the right, we have, yeah, low budget dev and Rempi, you can, you know, you can make pretty high production quality visual novel um, or narrative driven game with Rempi. And I guess like the last thing I want to say is like, I really do encourage people to try out Rempi, whether they know um, Python really well or not, or if you know game development that much at all or not. When After I spoke to, I spoke at PyCon US, actually some 
some people have told me that, oh, like I've had my, my children like made a game in RenPy already or something like, oh, I tried it and it was really, really intuitive, very simple to use. Um, I would say it's very programmer friendly. And if you are a seasoned Python developer or game developer, like you are able to just like tweak things and make different things um, based on what you wanted to do. So I think, um, thank you, Rempy Tom or Pi Tom, the um, original creator of um, Rempy. Uh, I think that what you wanted to make was really, really great. So yeah, this was my studio's first game, uh, Summer with the Shiba Inu, and then I've also been working on my second game, Death Becomes You, which is the murder mystery that I showed earlier in the camera pan example. Um, so now you can go make your own narrative game in Rempy. So here's where you could find me. I'm on Twitter, Quill Studios, on LinkedIn as Susan Shu Cheng, um, where I talk more about data science and machine learning. And of course, you can find my games on Steam as well as the consoles. Um, so thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed uh, this talk and found it helpful. So we have our speaker. And she's Suzanne, all the way from Canada. And Suzanne, can you say hi to all the spectators here? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, <laughs> thanks, everyone, for joining um, the Q&A session. Yes, yeah, she could. Yeah, she, she is, she uh, is uh, playing a play where she's unable to turn on her camera. So I think it's fine. But uh, we can just keep hearing her and her uh, answers to our questions. So a little bit about Suzanne. And I'm actually amused to introduce her. She is currently in Canada and she's the founder and also the sole developer of Quill Game Studios. It's her own studio that she uh, built and she's also working on many other stuff as well. Like she is also a principal data scientist at ClearBank. It's a fintech company. And also she is an active contributor to PSF. Uh, she's a very uh, uh, active speaker as well. You can find her talks on PyCon US, PyCon Canada, and she will make you go crazy regarding gaming industry if you really, really get to know her. And that's what it is about Suzanne. And her talk was about uh, narrative-focused video games development with RenPy, which is uh, open source studio, you can say, or engine for gaming and related to Python. So yes, Suzanne, uh, that's your talk about. And the first question is from my side. And because I saw your talk and I was really excited that I really, really wanted to ask. This is from me. And then I will get go with the other questions that people have as well. I hope that's OK. Yeah, yeah, yes. absolutely. Thank you. The, oh, the first question, the first question I, I, I have is I have that. Is that what are the challenges that you ran into while developing your own game? I know you developed your own game as well. And like as a beginner to video game, I'm not much into video games. So I really want to know, like as a beginner, when you started in, on Fergo, when you, when you kept developing, what were the common challenges you would say that you ran into and how did you solve them? Yeah, I think um, one of the main things that I encountered was there, there's definitely a bit of difficulty when creating a new project from scratch, especially as one person. It's very hard to um, go from beginning, just like the ID uh, stage to completion. Um, so I definitely ran into uh, situations where I would just have ideas and then I wasn't able to uh, fully execute on them, right? So I could have like, you know, five ideas and then I kind of like get started on idea one uh, get distracted, and then go to idea two, right? But um, I think eventually what I learned was that uh, it's really important to stay focused on one idea only, or like, you know, if you have like one main idea and then like some smaller side ideas that you really keep small on purpose, um, that's like the main thing that really helped me go from, um, I guess, yeah, beginning uh, creating a game and then just like getting started and then um, being able to finish doing the entire project, yeah, which is kind of like keeping the scope 
um, relatively small. I, I think for my first project, I actually created accidentally <laughs> created a larger game. That's why <laughs> that's why I kind of got really distracted on the way. But I think um, eventually learning those lessons and allowing myself to focus um, that was really what helped me. And I think in terms of like technical things, it's not massively, it's not like the most difficult thing to, which is to learn something, right? Because like people can take um, online courses or you can do like small projects. I think that's fully within most people's capabilities, but it's just like keeping yourself on track and like keeping focused. So I think like that's actually what I would um, say was what I really, <laughs> really learned along the way and how I was able to overcome those challenges. True, true, because, yeah, that is a point which is, uh, which everyone has, like, when we want to start developing a game, we are like, oh, my God, I have a lot of thoughts. How should I prioritize? How should I arrange? And then <laughs> things like that happen. So, yes, thank you so much for answering my question. And I was really curious to ask. Then, again, we have questions from the people here as well. That is, uh, Piyabat has a lot of questions coming in. So, he is like, how do you test players' emotions? Because even though we are sure that we have nailed that, but how do we really know exactly emotional emotion recognition? <laughs> no, I think that's a really difficult question because, like, I think um, when you're when you're making games, you can try to make games that are more focused on what you think the the players or the users will think. Um, but then I find that for myself, I kind of create games. Um, based on what I want to see, uh, uh, like kind of like as if I were the player, because I think it's very difficult to please everyone. I, I think the person who asked the question has actually just disconnected, but I think he's been kind of like reconnecting now and then. So hopefully he'll be able to um, <laughs> get the answer or if you could kind of summarize it after. Um, but yeah, like I think um, it is really difficult. I think another another way to do that for like larger scope projects is just like get more playtesters because like usually I, I, I end up getting a lot of friends uh, to playtest my game and then they'll they'll be able to provide feedback. Um, it's also pretty good to get strangers to playtest your games because then they can provide more uh, objective feedback. Yeah, so hopefully, um, um, I, I think this guy, I forgot his name, uh, could yeah get the answer because I yeah I think he 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 uh, is going to watch the recorded one. Yeah. So so yeah, but I hope yeah, that, I answers, hope your that answers your question. I think yes. If, if you can just put it in the chat. In the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think he had to hop up. I think I saw Francois had a question. Yes, Francois yes, as well had a, had a question. So his question was: When developing a game, what is the split between development, graphic design, and other production tasks? Wow. Yeah, I think that's a that's a pretty good question. So I think it definitely depends a bit on the game. Like I would say for myself, um, because I started out um, with the role of the programming, so I, I really underestimated the roles of the other things. Like so, for example, like project management or like production really takes a lot of time. And then I kind of didn't realize that until I really went ahead and like made a game myself. So I would say like that probably takes like 30% of the time. Programming probably takes another 30%. And I think like managing people, oh, actually I would say like managing people is included in like production. So that's kind of like, I, I didn't do the art myself. So then I um, hired artists to do that but then I had to manage their work right because like they would provide sketches um, I would say hey I, I don't uh, I, I think this part needs to be changed a little bit or I would say oh this part looks really good um, that takes time on my end as well um, to kind of like manage um, different I, I guess like manage the artists um, so it's kind of um, changed throughout different games because I think she she has just encountered some. I think she she got disconnected. So just let, let's wait. A... Yeah, yeah. Um, 
that is why we recorded all the talk. <laughs> oh God. I know this is the part and parcel of online con uh, conferences. There is something that we can't do anything with is technical issue. Oh, she's back. back. Oh, hi. Um, where where did it cut off? I think um, I, I thought the, the time, I, I think the room kicked me out or something. No, no, no. no. <laughs> okay, okay. But yeah, I guess like where, where was I? I think I was talking about how production takes more time than expected. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that was pretty much, uh, that kind of like concludes my answer about it. Um, hopefully, I don't know when exactly it cut off, but to summarize, yeah, production takes like 30, 40 percent of the time. Yeah, you were just giving us a glimpse that coding that takes 30 percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other yeah, yeah, yeah. Design design oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. So I think, um, yeah, overall, I think the part that was missing was me saying that as um, I, I did different projects, like the the balance kind of changes because um, I wanted to focus less on writing and more on programming. So then I hired someone to do that. So then um, I would spend more time on production because I'd have to manage people. Yeah, so that, that was the part that was missed. Yeah, I know how hard, know it, how is. hard it is. You do development, you do development as well as, as, you, well man as you manage management. management. Yeah, yeah, I have to do that. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's running around everywhere to look at. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So there so was another there was question. Another question from from my... From my... Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I have time for one more one more question just to um, wrap things up. Yes. yes. So my, so question, my was, question was how to get how started to get with started rents, 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 by, rent like, by? I know it's, I a, know kind it's of a kind of <laughs> big platform, mm -hmm. platform. and I, I remember when I tried to build a game, like a game on Pi, Pi Pi game using Pi game, Pi small yeah, 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 game, yeah. Like, game like Flappy Bird, Flappy Bird. Mm -hmm. very basic very game. Basic. So it was working it was fine. But when I tried, I tried uh, uh, using Ren Pi uh, out, of, uh, the out, out of the inspiration after watching after animes, watching animes I yeah. found it very, very, very hard. hard. How how would you suggest would you us suggest to get started with Ren Pi? Any tutorial you would suggest? Suggest. Ooh, I think that's a really good question. I I wonder um if things have changed over the years because like. Right now, and I, I, I acknowledge that this wasn't the case a few years ago, like right now they have an out-of-the-box um, sample project, which you can then modify and understand. Um, so when I, when I gave this talk at PyCon US, like it turns out that um, there were people who, um, with the improved sample project, like they had, like their kids were able to um, create and customize a game. Um, so I think this is something that it has probably changed throughout the years. It, it's highly possible that when you tried it, um, probably this wasn't available. So then it would have been quite difficult. I would say like right now the learning curve is like much better. Yeah. Hopefully that's, that's that helps. Perfect. Yeah, because I've seen GenPy years back. Uh, I think it was around in 2016 or something. Oh yeah, I think I think stuff, things stuff. yeah things would have changed a lot since then. Yes, yes. yes. Now when I now open when I by, by, a lot of balloons in that. So I was like, where should I get should started? I get started? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so um, thanks again. I guess like for having me on the Q and A. Like, unfortunately, yes, I do yes, have yes, to yes, drop yes. off. But um, yeah, thanks again for for coming and for asking the questions. No problem. Thank no problem. you so much, Thank Susan, so for, much. Joining for joining us. us. Uh, once again, we had a great time.